Hello everyone. Uh, let's get started. So uh, in the last lecture, we were talking about plasmonic matter surfaces. And I told you that, uh, I mean, we understand plasmonic resonances and they enable extremely high confinement of electromagnetic energy. Uh, we can confine light down to few tenths of nanometer scale. And uh, I said that, okay, this sort of confinement is useful for propagating energy on a chip. And it's also useful for various other applications like, you know, uh, let's say beam bending or uh, sun sensing and so on. Okay. But plasmonic uh, meta surfaces also suffer from one drawback. That is the inherent loss in the metal. We, we have seen that we choose either silver or gold because they exhibit extremely low loss. But even then, uh, that can be significant in some applications. Okay, In that kind of a scenario, it turns out that uh, dielectric nanoparticles or dielectric nanostructures are useful. The reason is we can try to engineer uh, the response in such a way that we, we can, we, the dielectric structures suffer extreme, have extremely low loss and they can be useful. All right. So I have s shown this slide in the past. We have considered what happens when you have electromagnetic wave incident on a sphere, let's say. So I talked about the me theory, I think in the week four, where we discussed plasmonics. And towards the end, I also just uh, briefly flashed this slide wherein, you know, we can calculate the, the scattering cross sections. So for example, if you have a uh, electro electromagnetic wave incident on the sphere, it scatters. But how efficiently it scatters is essentially captured by scattering efficiency. And that is what is shown here. And so you have various peaks and I briefly talked about, you know, the modes that are there. You can have electric and magnetic resonances that are there. Electric is a typical, you know, dipole and the quadrupole. Uh, but in addition, you can also have circulating currents, you know, displacement currents inside the nanoparticle that can give you magnetic dipole, magnetic quadrupole and so on. And those are the peaks that we have identified here. Right. So we talked about this and this is exactly the same me theory that we've used. We just replaced the dielectric constant of a metal with a semiconductor or you know uh, uh, yeah high, uh, semiconductor high index semiconductor for example silicon or gallium arsenide you get these curves okay the only issue is the size of the nanoparticle is quite large for example here the silicon, uh, silicon sphere diameter is about 200 nanometers and we have already seen that uh, for plasmonic structures plasmonic uh, resonances the sphere diameter would be something like you know 50 to 100 and so on if you go to larger diameters there's a red shift of the resonance okay so this is essential, uh, this me resonances in dielectric nanoparticles are very critical to dielectric nanophotonics. So I just wanted to review this. Okay. But how does, you know, uh, the dielectric material help? Okay. When I say dielectric, you know, I, I use it in a very loose sense. For example, you know, if you are very precise, then you will say glass is a dielectric, but silicon is a semiconductor. But for me, I, I'm referring to both glass and semicon uh, let's say silicon also as a dielectric because the band gap is large. They don't have any intrinsic, uh, there's no conductivity. And even if there is some carrier density in the semiconductor, it's a doped semiconductor. And then the, the free carrier density will, res will give rise to true response. And the other part of it is a dielectric response, which is coming from, let's say, intrinsic semiconductor. So I, I use this term when I say dielectric, I, I mean both uh, uh, doped semiconductors and also insulators. All right. So uh, I already mentioned loss. Okay. So we have this traditional uh, plasmonic uh, resonances. So you excite the plasmonic resonance and you can also have the split ring kind of structures wherein you know there's a circulating uh, electric field and that causes a magnetic field. And uh, I mentioned that these structures suffer from loss. So this is an example here. So basically this is the loss for silver and sorry gold and silver plotted with respect to wavelength. And you see that a silicon loss is quite low. You might say, oh, silicon should actually have loss up to one, uh, 1,100 nanometers. Why is the loss low? Well, it turns out that silicon, you can also make amorphous silicon. If you have amorphous silicon, it has a band gap of about, uh, optical band gap of about 700 nanometers. Anything about that, it's lossless. All right. So yeah, then there are other materials which can have low loss. So uh, that's why, you know, one of the reasons, you know, people have moved towards uh, dielectric nanophotonics in the last uh, six, seven years. So starting roughly about 2015 or so, this trend started. Another, ad another uh, advantage of uh, dielectric materials when compared to metals is that they are CMOS compatible. 
so what i mean by that is you can use a traditional you know foundries the standard equipment that we have in the clean rooms and all that we can use it to fabricate the structure so the patterning quality can be much better if you want to pattern metal structures you'll have to do a process either called as a lift off or you know uh, focus and be and be milling and so on which are, can be a little bit uh, tricky and it not scalable but for dielectric structures i think we can use the standard uh, cmos techniques very easily and uh, the cmos compatible compatibility is also referred to as i mean sometimes people talk of uh, it as you know you can fabricate these structures in the standard fabs well yeah that is possible there are some caveats in any way there all right so that is the ad- second advantage of uh, dielectric structures and the third advantage is this uh, the the presence of these unique modes you know we when we talked about the metal nanostructures we only mentioned the plasmonic dipole essentially okay and if you have a large structure then higher order modes come into picture but there are no magnetic response uh, there's no magnetic response in metal okay unless you actually create something like a split ring okay but if you look at dielectric structures as for example a silicon sphere it has an intrinsic magnetic dipole and that can give you a very nice uh, uh, design you know space for you to engineer the response okay the presence of this electric and magnetic dipoles together can be useful why is it useful well one of the applications could be to engineer directionality when we studied the dipole we understood that whenever there is a axis along the axis of dipole there is no radiation and the radiation only occurs perpendicular to it like a donut shape right that is with a single dipole suppose if i am looking at it in this direction there is forward and backward uh, radiation which i don't like sometimes i want only unidirectional propagation so that i can efficiently transfer my energy in one direction right so such a such a thing is not possible with a pure electric dipole you also need a magnetic response either you engineer it with you know things like split rings but then how do you make both of them overlap and all becomes an issue or you have to have multi layer structures to engineer the magnetic response in any case if you have both electric and magnetic dipoles i can orient them perpendicular to each other and i'll see that the direct, uh, the emission be- or you know the, the scattering becomes predominantly in one direction for example here we are let's say having a Uh, such a scenario where uh, you have combination of electric and magnetic dipoles there is an incident radiation and it is getting scattered only in the forward direction so this is one application i can think of uh, i can uh, i can think of geometries where you know you you uh, you have contributions different differing contributions from these electric and magnetic dipoles and that can even cause back scattering to happen all right so these are the various uh, advantages of having uh, dielectric nanophotonics if you're interested you can actually look at uh, the review published by arsenic and stuff and others all right so uh and with this uh, structures people have realized uh, starting roughly about 2015 that a lot of applications are possible and some of them are uh, some uh, just briefly mentioned here so one application could be beam bending we talked about the beam bending in uh, metal nanostructures there the problem again is efficiency how much are you able to actually get into a cross polarized light cross polarized beam and so on if you, the, and the losses of metal also play a role so you cannot get very high efficiencies but with dielectric structures researchers have shown that you can in principle have bending in which our uh, uh, diffraction mode you want and then that uh, beam bending has been demonstrated you can also use it for focusing light you now for example like a lens i'll talk about this in a little bit detail in the next slide and then you can also generate these vortex beams you know we saw the donut shape profile that we created with a uh, plasmonic matter surface a similar thing can be done with dielectric surfaces and even more richer variety of uh, structures can be generated or you know structured light can be generated you can create holograms and uh, light you know uh, structural color so you just instead of, this looks like almost like a real color but then this is actually if you look zoom into it it's all structural color with various antennas which are arranged in a particular shape and there's also things like fluorescence enhancement that we can create because a semiconductor can actually give you fluorescence and if you engineer the nanostructure you can actually create m- much more efficient fluorescence so some of these applications people have looked at so uh, i would not be able to go into details of many of these things so what i'll do is i'll pick three different applications okay to try to give you a flavor of what is the research about the first one is what is known as metal lenses okay so if you look at any traditional microscope you know the standard uh, microscope that is used in the biomedical community or even in uh, physical sciences they have an objective now this is an ex- uh, objective that you know i picked up from the internet somewhere you know the edmund optics objective and those are very highly engineered uh, uh 
pieces of equipment the objective itself can be quite expensive depending on what sort of features it has and the reason is it has a lot of parameters that are important the you know the the working distance the magnification and so on whether it's immersion or uh, normal air and lot lot of things the numerical aperture how much how much of uh, light is it able to capture and so on so to to create these objectives uh, people actually use multiple lenses so if you if you look at a cross section of this object there will be many many lenses which are precisely aligned to get maximum performance but then it turns out to be quite you know big you know for example it would be of the size of 2 or 3 inches maybe 4 inches 3 2 to 3 inches is what i would say it would be okay so can we make it smaller that's been a, one of the limiting factors for all the imaging equipment if i want to you know let's say have a compact imaging system then yeah i would like my objective to be smaller similarly in the cell phone i have these lenses which are focusing light from outside on to the ccd camera in ccd inside so can the lenses on the mic on the phone be smaller so there are a lot of applications where you don't want uh, thinner and uh, more efficient lenses so one of the ways to create that is by using uh, the ideas of uh, meta surfaces so here is a picture of uh, basically a circular arrangement of nano structures if you zoom into a some small section on the edges you will see something like this so these are essentially titanium dioxide nano pillars which are arranged in some fashion the angle of rotation of the the nano structure here gives a different phase and that's called as a geometric phase in the literature so essentially what you can do is uh, we are mimicking the the typical lens for example if you have a standard lens you have a convex lens like this so in the center you have a large phase shift that is uh, the the beam slows down by a significant amount because there's a thick glass on the edges you have a thin glass so the the face advances and then overall the face envelope face envelope actually becomes curved and it starts to go and focus on a particular point so similarly if you engineer faces in this uh, this was originally done in the context of optics you know in what are called what they call as fresnel zone plates so essentially you have plates which are you know having different different phases along the circumference you know and then you can actually focus light and things like that so people have tried this and uh, this is work from professor kapasos group again from harvard so they showed that with these dielectric structures you can actually create a focused light and they are comparable to the the standard objectives of course there are some limitations of these lenses but still you know considering the size you know this is i said 2 inches this will be about i think uh, roughly lambda lambda by 2 or so wavelength i mean roughly in that con uh, on the order of wavelength height okay so you are able to get focusing so you are able to uh, so they have demonstrated that these lenses are possible all over the visible wavelengths and this is basically an image of a standard um, uh, reference that if you image and you show that it's clearly made that means you are able to resolve features very well so they showed that you can actually uh, fabricate these lenses for blue green and red and so on so over the visible wavelengths you can fabricate these structures so and i think a lot of there's a lot of interest in trying to do this because you know this can be useful for a lot of ar and uh, virtual reality applications i would like to have a lens which will only focus on my eye but others cannot see i mean a lot of things can be talk, talked about in this context okay so there is a lot of interest in this so this is one application i wanted to talk about another application i want to mention is much more uh, fundamental i would say so all of us have heard about brewster angle if i ask you what brewster angle is from let's say you will say that oh when light is incident in a material like glass uh, the reflected ray is polarized and essentially at that brewster angle uh, there won't be any polarized light the reflection polarized reflection becomes zero so for example i have a particular angle of incidence and then this uh, exiting beam if i have reflection beam this will be uh, s polarized okay the transmitting beam will have both s and p polarization the reason this happens is if you you know if you go back into the basics the incident electric field will actually excite dipoles and when this reflected ray forms an angle of 90 degrees with the uh, refracted ray what happens is the dipoles are oriented in this direction and then there is no emission in that direction for the p polarized light so only s polarization remains so no emission from uh, p polarized dipoles okay if you if you looked at it just even maybe you know 10 years back people would have said, most of the people would have said oh brister angle is something fixed you know you just take the tan inverse of the refractive index and you get that and that, that's, that's what it is so in the top these two figures are both you know for optically uh, uh, for just epsilon not equal to 1 mu equal to 1 so basically they are not magnetically active all right but then with the idea of this meta surfaces it 
it turns out that you uh, brewster angle is no longer a material property fixed material property you can actually engineer the way we can engineer is i'll excite let's say instead of just this pure electric dipoles now i have let's say in a dielectric structure i have i can excite both electric and magnetic dipoles and i can look at the conditions i can carefully design the uh, resonances and the geometry you know i can i can take these uh, resonances and arrange them in a lattice and i can carefully engineer the sizes and the periodicities and so on such that i can have zero reflection in both s and p polarized light okay so this was a nice experiment that was you know very nicely explained by ramon ramon paniago dominguez he is at istar and then uh, the istar team had done the measurements and then later he explained this very well so we can look at this paper for the details so just to tell you what it is i'm just showing you the simulation results for a couple of uh, for for different scenarios so you see here this is a reflection for people rays light and this is the people rays light which is going to Uh, zero the reflection is going to zero at a particular angle and you would call that as a brewster angle now you see that for various wavelengths that you know angle at which it reflection goes to zero can change in principle you can even go below 45 degrees you know if you take simply a glass you would say that the uh, the brewster angle is what 57 degrees no sorry uh, tan inverse of uh, 1.5 is how much uh, arc tan anyway so you'll see that it's 56 degrees for 1.5 index but then even if you you know you can even go much below that and this you can do for p polarization and this is for s polarization s polarization also you can have a brewster angle means at which the reflection goes to zero so that can occur at different wavelengths and this can be done with arrays of uh, uh, dielectric uh, spheres you know for example silicon spheres or you can even just make disks out of it in this paper they have experimentally considered disks what happens when you arrange a series of disks they have shown that you can have this brewster effect and they called it generalized brewster effect so you see uh, whatever was taken as a kind of a law not very long ago is now you know uh, just one special case when basically you have this magnetic response as well so in these two cases you have both electric and magnetic responses so combination of these two things can actually give you newer functionality so this is a second example i wanted to show you and the third example is again the beam bending that we talked about in the context of plasmonic uh, metal surfaces so in this case you know uh, we can also have dielectric structures so in the plasmonic uh, resonances or plasmonic metal surfaces we are exploiting the idea of resonance that is just one way of introducing the phase uh, you can also introduce a phase gradient by just letting it propagate along a nanowire you now for example if i just take this sort of a structure wherein i have a high index material which is one pillar sitting on top of a surface the extent you know the diameter of the i can change the diameter of my pillar and then that will introduce various different amounts of phases so this is one uh, calculation done for diameter of a cylinder on the x axis and the relative phase that is introduced along the as it as light propagates along the cylinder so this is i think for a fixed height of 460 nanometer height so you see that as the diameter increases the phase is changing and that's going from we can depending on the length you can go from 0 to 2 pi okay that we can choose different structures so what we have done was we picked up four different uh, points on this four different diameters and then arrange them in this fashion that you know in the along the let's say if i call this as x direction you have a phase gradient along the x direction in the y direction there is no change when i have phase gradient we already saw that the light bends okay so now the interesting part is by, by this this structure you are we were able to show that you can have bending at a particular you know in a particular diffraction order and only in that direction if you want to we saw that if you have a typical grating you will have incidence like this and there will be zero at order there will be first zero plus 1 minus 1 and so on but because we have introduced a phase gradient the the light tends to go in a particular direction and that is what is shown here and it also turns out that uh, this can be shown both for s and p polarizations the measurement data is shown and if you look at the relative efficiencies the amount of light going into particular diffraction order compared to the overall transmitted light it can even reach up to 70 to 80% so that's very high efficiency of beam bending that can be shown with dielectric metal surfaces so uh, these are three different examples that i wanted to take to convince you that uh, dielectric metal surfaces are something that is exciting and people are looking at maybe who knows you know we can pick up some of these ideas and apply to something else so the whole uh, uh, idea of better materials has hope opened up a lot of interesting prospects 
wherein we go and relook at some fundamental ideas and we try to analyze and see what happens so uh, with that i would like to close the discussion for today or you know this week so uh, in the next week i would like to talk about uh, tunable and active meta uh, meta materials or meta surfaces all right so uh, i'll see you next week i hope uh, uh, you're enjoying the course and if you have any questions i'll welcome please post it on the discussion forums we'll be happy to answer if you need some help we'll have one to one interactions i can't emphasize this enough all right so all right we'll see you thank you so much bye